Every revolution starts in the minds of the people. Arm yourself for the war of ideas. Take back your life. Take back your liberty. Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Today, my guest is Michael Mahari. Michael serves as the National Communications Director for the Tenth Amendment Center and also the managing editor of the Shift Gold website. He's also the author of four books, including Constitution Owner's Manual, Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty, Smashing Myths, Understanding Madison's Notes on Nullification, and another book on nullification called Nullification Objections, Dismantling the Opposition. He's also penned several eBooks and he hosts the Friday Gold Wrap podcast. So he's a very busy man. I appreciate him being here. Mike, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. A lot of people have been asking me because of my book, It's the Fed Stupid, about inflation. And of course, the national media wants to focus on President Biden, and I'm, I'm sure he hasn't helped. We want to talk about the Federal Reserve and the dominant role that it plays in creating inflation. And we also want to know what to do about it. So I have a feeling as managing editor of the Shift Gold website, you've got a few ideas about that. What do you think that most Americans should be doing to combat inflation? Well, I think the first thing is to not be holding a lot of cash. You don't want to be in dollars because by definition, inflation is simply the devaluing of your currency. And you're absolutely right. This is almost exclusively a Federal Reserve phenomenon. Of course, the federal government is involved because it takes the money that is effectively creates out of thin air and showers it upon everybody so they can spend money on things that they didn't produce. But it's devaluing your money. And you see that every day as you go into the store. Almost every day, things cost more. I'm experiencing this in mass math. We just bought a house, so we're doing renovations. And every time I walk into Home Depot, I've I have sticker shock. So obviously you don't want to be holding on to cash because your dollar today is not going to be worth uh, as much tomorrow as it is today. So you want to look for alternative assets that you can hide your money in that will not be as impacted by the inflationary pressure. Traditionally, gold and silver have been inflation hedges. Uh, the last year, they have not been behaving as such, and we can get into why that is here in just a second if you want to. But I, I think long-term, being in hard assets, gold and silver is wise, commodities, things that are going to increase in price along with inflation. So uh, industrial metals, agricultural products, things like that are good investments. Uh, foreign stocks, foreign investments, because ostensibly as the dollar devalues, it will increase the value of other currencies relatively. So things like that. But the key is you don't want to be in dollar. Bitcoin is a possibility. And I'm a little wary of Bitcoin and we can get into that as well if you want to delve into that rabbit hole. Well, it's funny because I've had some Bitcoin proponents on the show and thankfully, John Bush did a good job of getting through my thick skull exactly how it works. So I feel like I understand it now. And of course, help from Robert Murphy. But there's a great Gilligan's Island episode, and I'm showing my age. But there's a scene where they're all arguing about something, and the professor says, well, I think we should do X, Y, Z. And Gilligan says, I think the professor's got a point. And then, of course, Mr. Howell comes in and says the exact opposite thing disagrees with them completely. And Gilligan says, Mr. Howell makes a good point. Right. And after two or three rounds of this, the skipper gets fed up and he says, Gilligan, you can't agree with everybody. And of course, Gilligan, you know what, skipper, you've got a point too. <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, when, that's when Gilligan gets the hat. I actually remember that episode. That's funny. So that's how I am with Bitcoin. Every time I hear your president there, Mr. Schiff, um, saying that this is a complete farce. I'm like, yeah, well, how could I even possibly believe it? That I go on, I listen to Bob Murphy, I listen to John Bush. I'm like, of course, this is the answer for freedom. So make the case either for gold against Bitcoin, why they're both the same. What do you think? Well, let me say this first. I think there's an old adage in investing. And let, let me preface this. I'm not an investment guru. 
I play one on the internet, so I'm not giving <laughs> investment advice. Okay. So we should make that clear. I'm just, these are my opinions and you can take them for what they're worth. I think they're educated opinions, but I'm not giving investment advice. That's very important to say, but I, I think there's an old adage in investing that you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. And I think that's the primary truth that folks need to wrap their heads around. I would not recommend putting all of your money in Bitcoin, but neither would I you know, say put all of your money in gold. Uh, I think diversifying your portfolio is the wisest investment strategy. So things are, are balanced out. I like Bitcoin kind of in the long term. I'm not so big on it as an investment today. So I'm kind of in between the really bullish folks and, and Peter Schiff. Um, when I say I'm bullish on it in the long term, I love Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general as a means of transaction, as a way to transact business, to exchange with other folks without having the government involved. There's the whole blockchain. There's the privacy aspect of it. It's very difficult for third parties to intervene in that. In that. And I think that's really the future of cryptocurrency. And I love it in that sense that it brings monetary competition. And that's something that we desperately need uh, in today's world where the Federal Reserve has effect monopoly on money. And because of that, it can inflate away your wealth and you have very little alternative. Uh, if we can find ways to transact business, alternative monies, whether it be gold, silver, crypto, or something else, then that is a positive. We want currency competition. We want competition in the marketplace for money, just like we want competition for any other good or service. But today, I think Bitcoin is being viewed by most most who are in it as kind of a store of value. And I don't think it works as well for that because it's just too volatile. And we've seen that volatility. We've seen it as high as what, $60,000. And, and, you know, recently it's been back below 40 and, you know, uh, it goes from a thousand to 20,000. That volatility really makes it difficult, I think, to serve its, its better function as a means of transaction because uh, a business can't really depend on taking crypto, Bitcoin in particular, one day and then the next day it may be $2,000 less. So I, I think that's a problem that we have in the short and intermediate term. I think if you look at it from an investment standpoint right now, it is behaving as a risk asset. It is behaving much in the same way as a risky stock. Um, and, and folks are putting money into it and they're hoping it'll climb up and, and they can make a killing on it. And you know, if folks time that market right, you can certainly do that. But on the other hand, I, I don't think it is behaving as an inflation hedge, as some people want to say, or, or as an alternative money, because again, it's simply too volatile. And there are some things that I like if, if I'm looking at preserving my wealth, I want to hold something that won't devalue and that I can use uh, in the worst case scenario, say a, a total financial collapse. We know that gold and silver have served as money for thousands of years. There's no reason to believe they're going to stop serving as money anytime in the future. They have intrinsic value outside of their role as money. And these are some things that I think are problematic for crypto. They aren't tangible. They don't have any value outside of whatever value people give it or as a means of, of transaction. They are vulnerable in a crisis because you don't have an internet, you don't got access to your crypto. And that's, to me, one of the biggest downfalls that if you're kind of looking at a, again, a worst case scenario, I want to have something that I can hold in my hand, gold, silver, I have it in a safe, I can get it out, I can barter with it, I can touch it. If I have all of my money wrapped up in cryptocurrency and the power grid goes down or the internet goes down or the government blocks the internet, I've got a real problem on my hands. So those are some, I think, of the downside of crypto. And again, looking far term, I do see it as a great competition for money. On the other hand, the question is, which crypto is that going to be? There's hundreds of them out there. And of course, Bitcoin's probably the best known, but there are many others. And it remains to be seen which one will ultimately rise in the market to be kind of the go-to. So I think there's a lot of inherent risk in investing in cryptocurrency. I'm not saying don't do it. 
I have cryptocurrency, but I think you should be wise and diversify that and recognize that it has risk. And I think a lot of times the real pro crypto folks, they get so gung ho that they forget that as with anything, there are risks and downsides. And you always have to look at both sides of the equation when you're talking about investing and preserving your wealth. Yeah, you make a good point that Bitcoin might turn out to be the MySpace of cryptos, right? It broke the ground, but then something better comes along. Is it true that if I buy something with Bitcoin, I was reading this the other day, and for some reason I was not considering this, but at least as far as the federal government is concerned, if I buy a car with Bitcoin, am I paying a capital gains tax on the Bitcoin that I exchanged, even though I used it as a currency, just like I sold some gold or whatever? Yes, I think that is true. Now, I haven't looked at the tax laws, but it would be the same with gold at this point in a lot of places. So if you have a capital gains tax on gold and silver, ultimately, if you're buying something with gold, what you're doing is you're selling the gold for dollars and then transacting in dollars, at least in as far as the IRS is concerned. So there is that potential. Now, of course, with crypto, you do have the, at least the possibility of anonymity, especially if you're operating with your own wallets outside of these big platforms like Coinbase and whatnot that are absolutely going to track and report what you're doing with your crypto. So there is a, a level of anonymity to crypto. And there's actually that same anonymity in gold and silver. There are certain transactions that you can make with gold and silver that are not required to be reported to the IRS. And that gets really complicated, but we actually have a section over at shiftgold.com uh, that kind of goes over those. It's a PDF that goes over those tax rules for both gold and silver. But yeah, that is, that is a problem. So, and, and it's also a problem for gold and silver, as I said. So when you're looking at currency competition, it's very important for governments to eliminate those barriers. And of course, the federal government doesn't want to. But what we have seen with uh, gold and silver at the state level and crypto in, in a couple of states, we've seen situations where states have eliminated the sales tax and eliminated the capital gains tax, at least at the state level. And there have been some proposals to actually give folks a credit on their uh, capital gains tax at the federal level down to the state level to encourage this currency competition. Arizona has been a leader in gold and silver in these terms. And then Wyoming has been a leader in cryptocurrency and trying to try to lower these regulatory barriers so that it can be used uh, in a way those of us who, who love liberty and freedom would like to see it used. Let's take a short break for this important message. Most people consider it a fact of life that prices are going to go up over time and they've never gone up as fast as they are right now. But what if I told you it wasn't always like that, that for over 100 years, prices went down in America, even as the economy became more productive? Well, it's true. And as much as we like to blame the president when the economy is bad, presidents really have very little effect on our modern economy. The real culprit behind not only price inflation, but the constant booms and busts we suffer is the Federal Reserve System. My new book, It's the Fed, Stupid, is an appeal to Americans across the political spectrum to stop focusing on things that don't make a difference and start focusing on what does. Whether you're worried about constantly rising prices, wage stagnation, increasing wealth and income inequality, or the massive expansion of the government's size and power, they can all be traced back to an institution the powerful would prefer you ignored. Download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com and find out what you should really be fighting against. And now, back to our episode. You work on the answer, then you quietly save the day. You were right, Mr. Spock, about everything you said. We humans just are logical, too crazy in the head. I've been on quite a bit of media <clears throat> for my book. And when they ask me, well, how could we ever get rid of the Fed? I just fall back to Ron Paul's solution from as far back as I've been reading his stuff, which is just 
take those capital gains and sales taxes off gold and silver. And I'm sure he'd be all for Bitcoin as well now. And just give the dollar some competition. The Fed says that it's managing it better than the market could. Okay, let's see kind of funny that they don't allow any competition. So let me switch gears for a minute and run a little bit of history by you and get your take on it. So back in the 2000s, when we thought what they were doing then was inflating irresponsibly, <laughs> and it was, but by comparison, it was rather mild. Gold went up to 1900 knocked on the door of $2,000 an ounce. And then right when they really poured it on during quantitative easing, when I and a lot of people thought, well, that's going to send it even higher, gold pulled way back 50%. Now it's risen back again. It's knocking on the door. It's 1800, whatever it is today. And they just quintupled the money supply. I mean, just makes everything that they've done before this for a hundred years look like child's play. Why do you think gold isn't through 2000 and running for 10 by now? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's probably the number one question that we get over at Shift Gold. That's what the brokers tell me. Everybody's asking that question. And gold really has been range bound over the last six to eight months between 1750 and then every once in a while get above 1800 and maybe knock on the door of 1850, but it's really been locked in that range. And given the fact that even using the government's cooked CPI number, we're looking at 7% inflation rate. If you actually took an honest CPI, we're talking 15%. You can go to shadow stats and actually track the uh, CPI as it was calculated back in the 1970s. And, and you can see that it's much higher than what they're telling us. So gold as an inflation hedge should be going through the roof. Well, why isn't it? And I really think there's this misperception that we've had in the markets over the last year. Everybody has been laser focused on what is the Fed going to do? And there's this anticipation every time that we saw a hotter than expected CPI print, we would get this sell-off in gold, which doesn't make sense. It's intuitively backward. And what we were seeing were people were thinking, okay, inflation is running hot. The Fed is going to have to abandon this transitory inflation narrative that they were pitching and go to a tighter monetary policy. And then gradually we saw them talking about that. And then over the last couple of months, they have uh, actually given us plans. We're going to raise interest rates uh, three to four times in the next year. We might get to 1%. Ooh. <laughs> by the uh, end of 2021, uh, end of 2022. And there's the misperception. The, the conventional wisdom, and this is true, is that gold has an opportunity cost. Uh, if you're holding gold, it doesn't generate interest. So if I have money and I put it in a bond or put it in a stock, it's going to generate some type of income. Gold just sits there. It appreciates with inflation, generally speaking. So there's that opportunity cost. So when inflation interest rates rise, then the opportunity cost of holding gold goes up as well. So you're foregoing that whatever three or 4% interest you could have if you were in a 10-year treasury bond. What people are completely ignoring, and maybe they're starting to wake up to it a little bit, is real interest rates. The real interest rate is deeply negative. And when I say real interest rate, that is just the current interest rate minus the inflation rate. So if you look at the 10-year treasury, I think it was at like 2.75%. Last time I looked, it might be 2.8 now. You have 7% inflation. So that means you're somewhere in the negative five when it comes to your real interest rate. There's no opportunity cost of holding gold when interest rates are negative five. The, the opportunity cost is holding those dollars where you're losing that 5% every single year on its purchasing power. So I think people are focused on normative interest rates. I think there's a, an over-optimism about how much the Fed can actually do to fight inflation. And so I think there's this misperception in the market, and I believe it's going to correct itself at some point. I think things tend to return to the mean. They turn back to normal. The markets tend to be very short-sighted, but in the long run, it all tends to balance out. I do think we'll see gold and silver both begin to rise again, especially as people rise 1%. Uh, interest rate increase, tapering your bond purchases isn't really going to do anything to fight 15% inflation. We have to look back at what Paul Volcker did in 1980s. He raised interest rates to 20%. 
I think if they even get to two or three percent, it's going to collapse this bubble economy. So it's kind of a, a heads you lose, tails you lose scenario. If the Fed really does fight inflation and does what's necessary, it's going to crash the economy. You're going to see a deep recession. The stock market's going to, the bottom's going to come out of it. The bubble's going to deflate. If they don't deal with inflation, then we're going to continue to see this uh, devaluing of the dollar. And it could ultimately to lead to a currency crisis if they devalue it enough where the world starts saying, maybe we don't want to hold on to all these dollars. It could very quickly spiral out of control. Yeah. One of the things I've been very interested in, of course, is the answer the, to the question, and you just gave a good answer as to why we haven't seen it go just through the roof, even given all of the qualifications that you said. But I think people should also understand Price inflation is one thing that the Federal Reserve creates, and it's very destructive. And for anyone who hasn't heard me tell this story already, if you lived in the 19th century near the end of it, your grandfather didn't tell you, boy, that used to cost me so much less. I used to pay a dime to go to the movies. Well, there were no movies then, but he would say, boy, I can't believe you guys get this for so cheap. It used to cost me so much more for that. That was the life experience of most people. But the other thing is malinvestment. The Fed inflates the money supply, and it doesn't mean no real investment happens, but out of the total of investment out there on the margin, there's a lot of bad investment. And then when we get the crash, it's got to be corrected. I think Peter Schiff thinks the cryptos are one of those malinvestments. What do you think? I think that, I think there is, yes, I think there is some malinvestment in crypto. I don't know that, you know, Peter, Peter's the extreme. He, he'll tell you that it could go to zero. I don't really see that happening because I, I think there is a legitimate value in Bitcoin and, and particularly the blockchain technology. So again, I'm not nearly the, the pessimist on crypto as Peter is, but I do think there's a lot of malinvestment, particularly institutionally. Um, it's interesting if you look at the way Bitcoin has behaved over the last several months, it is tracked pretty closely with uh, a lot of the, what, like I said earlier, risk on assets. So your speculative stocks, your uh, riskier investments, it's tracked very, very strongly with that. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen this rotation in the stock market from the speculative tech stocks, the IPOs, and kind of a rotation back over into your more traditional uh, dividend paying uh, value stocks, GE and, and industrial stocks, things like that, oil companies, whatnot. And we've also seen the precipitous drop off in cryptocurrencies that has gone along with these riskier stocks. So I do think that there is some malinvestment that goes into it. And especially when you get into the institutional investors where they can take advantage of the low interest rates and borrow money and, and do things on margin and things like that, leverage purchases. That's where things can get really iffy in, in any kind of market. And I think 60,000 probably was a little bit extreme for Bitcoin at this point. And we saw it, we saw it drop off. But again, I'm not saying that there is no value in Bitcoin and that I would never put money in Bitcoin or anything like that. I think you should just be wary of it. And you can make a lot of money if you time the ins and outs right. And I will confess, I made a good bit of money on the first go around when, when it went way up. So you just have to be careful with it. And I think treat it more as a speculative asset at this point, rather than a value wealth preserving asset. I guess to wrap up, we should say that, first of all, whatever you think of Bitcoin, if you're a libertarian, you should think that it, A, should be allowed, B, should not be given a handicap against it with these taxes. Same with gold and silver, and we should just let the marketplace determine what's the best for everybody. And let me ask you to switch hats for a minute because you're also involved with the 10th Amendment Center. Because really what the Federal Reserve does is unconstitutional anyway. That's the Jeffersonian position. Is the 10th Amendment Center looking at monetary issues at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of alluded to it earlier in our discussion when I talked about states that are lowering taxes on gold and silver or eliminating taxes. And, and then we've also tracked very closely what Wyoming has done with crypto. And we view that ultimately as a, a kind of a step one toward doing what Ron Paul always wanted to do, and that's in the Fed. I'm pretty confident Congress is never going to end the Fed. 
that's just not the nature of Congress. But I do think that we can undermine that monopoly on money that the Federal Reserve has through state action. And ultimately, we can talk about what states can do, and we talked about those things already, make gold and silver and crypto legal tender, which will help facilitate their use, lower the taxes or eliminate the tax burdens, those types of things are all very important. But ultimately, it comes down to human action. Ultimately, it's up to us to utilize these alternatives uh, in, in our daily lives and, and establish ways to create currency competition in real life, looking at uh, barter networks, looking at trying the folks that are really heavily involved in the, in the crypto movement. I would really like to see them push more towards uh, getting rid of some of the barriers that exist in terms of using it every day make it so grandma can use a card to spend Bitcoin at the coffee shop. That's what we really, really need. And that's what I hope folks that are involved in that space will really start pushing and developing that technology so that we can really have that type of currency competition. We can use the state to some degree, but ultimately the state is not our friend and ultimately it's up to us. So I'm a big fan of human action. We will utilize the state as we can to create space for us to operate. But ultimately, again, it's up to us. And I think that's really the most important takeaway is, is to find ways in your everyday life to go around behind and underneath all of these government restrictions, including the Fed. Those are some great insights, Mike. I appreciate you being on. Where can people uh, find more of your writing and more of your activities in the Liberty Movement? Well, I'll give you three places that you can check out. Since we've primarily discussed the gold market and the Fed, you can check out shiftgold.com slash news. And pretty much that's all my content. Uh, we do post a lot of Peter's videos and whatnot that I kind of summarize, but uh, you'll also find original analysis there. Dealing with all the stuff that we've talked about today, the Fed, inflation, malinvestment, it's a very Austrian economic oriented insight. So uh, folks that are interested in that, go there. Um, if you're interested in how can we undermine the federal government, how can we decentralize, how can we devolve power away from Washington, D.C., down to the state and local level, and ultimately I'd like to see it devolved down to the individual, uh, you can check out 10thAmendmentCenter.com. It's all spelled out. And uh, over there, you'll see what we're doing in terms of what we call nullification, which is simply using um, state and local power to undermine the Fed. And, and to decentralize, because I think centralized power is one of the greatest threats to liberty. All governments are inherently bad. Uh, it's not that I love state governments or local governments. They're awful, too. But I think we're better off with a decentralized system where these jurisdictions compete and, and where we have some escape valves. And folks are moving to Florida because COVID policies. So I think that type of decentralized structure is better. And then finally, uh, I have my own website, michaelmeharry.com. It's just my name all run together. And uh, over there, you'll find some my old podcast. You'll find Constitution 101. You'll find a link to my books, all kinds of stuff over there. So those are the three places. All right. We'll link to all those on the show notes page. I appreciate you coming on, and I hope you'll come back as we see what disaster awaits us yes. from this monetary tsunami that the Federal Reserve has loosed upon us. And please do say hello to my friends, Peter Schiff and humble Michael Bolton at the 10th Amendment Center. And we'll look forward to talking to you next time. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'd love to come back anytime. Okay, friends, that's going to do it for today. If you haven't already, don't forget to download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com. And I'll see you next time. The war of ideas has only just begun. Arm yourself with the knowledge you need by heading to TomMullenTalksFreedom.com and subscribing to our email list. And remember, every revolution starts in the minds of the people.